Good morning, everyone. My name is Marty Miller. I'm with the Office of Rural and Farmworker Housing, which is a nonprofit based in Yakima, Washington. Uh, yeah, let's hear it for Yakima. All right, yeah, yeah. You know, um, one of the things that we're prioritizing in our development work is energy efficiency, uh, you know, so that these are built for the long run and they're affordable to operate. And in that spirit, I think we should turn off the camera. You know, let's save a little bit of energy. I don't need to be up there. <laughs> so anyway, just a thought, just a thought. Um, we appreciate you staying uh, uh, for this session. And, and the title of this session is Get to Know the National Rural Housing Coalition. Um, I'm the current president of NRHC and um, happy to serve in that role. And we'd like, uh, let me, just by a show of hands, uh, who's a, currently a member of the National Rural Housing Coalition? All right, great, good, glad to see it. Now, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, we'd like you to consider joining uh, because it's a, it's a great opportunity to network with colleagues doing similar work and also be an effective voice for advocacy on federal programs like you've just been hearing about. Um, a, little, a couple more quiz questions for you. Uh, raise your hand if you work on home ownership in rural communities. Okay, great. Wow, look at that's awesome. How about farm worker housing, something that's near and dear to my heart? Okay, good. Uh, water, water or wastewater issues in rural communities. Um, let's see, home repair, rehabilitation. Great, okay. So if, if you raised your hand, these are all. Preservation of rental housing, right, thank you, right, there we go, yeah, big one. Thanks, Bob, yeah, yeah. If you've raised your hand for any of these or multiple of these, but you didn't raise your hand to being a member in the National Rural Housing Coalition, I'd really encourage you to consider that membership because these are issues that are near and dear to our heart uh, and we work on, on a very regular basis, try to actively engage with the federal agencies that have a major impact on the work that we do and our tremendous resources that we want to try to take advantage of. Um, to consider joining uh, the National Rural Housing Coalition, there's, there's three ways you can do that. One is visiting our website, which is ruralhousingcoalition.org. You can even do it right now on your smartphones if you want. In fact, if I see you looking down, that's what I'm assuming you're doing, is you're <laughs> looking up ruralhousingcoalition.org and, and joining, so thank you for that. A second way is the brochures on your table. It describes a little more about the organization and there's also a handy form uh, that you can fill out and bring up here, I assume, Bob, is that right? Or, or they give to Lana or Jake. Or Lana or Jake. Um, there's, here's Lana and Jake is over here, so you're welcome to give those to uh, those forms to either Lana or Jake, and that'd be appreciated. The third way, if you don't have time for either of those, is to write your name and your email on a $20 bill and bring it up to me, <laughs> and I'll make sure it gets to Bob in the coffers of NRHC, and then we'll follow up with you. Um, so just briefly, NRHC was formed in 1969 to fight for better housing, community facilities, and low-income rural families. And today, we, we, our goal is to promote and defend the principle that rural people have the right, regardless of their income, to a decent place to live that they can afford, clean drinking water, and basic community services. So again, if you, if you believe in those things, which I know you do, we share those principles, and I'd encourage you to join. Um, how, so what, what does NRHC do? Well, I mentioned effective advocacy and a strong network of colleagues. Uh, the, the latter point is, has been very helpful to me during my time at the Office of Rural and Farmworker Housing. Uh, I frequently reach out to a number of you in this room to talk about issues that we want to resolve uh, together, um, like preservation, uh, like a whole variety of farmworker housing issues. Um, one of them that we had success on is uh, within the world of seasonal occupancy farm worker housing. For those of you familiar with Section 521 rental assistance, for a long time there's provision, a provision that that could be uh, used in the context of seasonal occupancy 
farm worker housing as operating assistance. But, but nothing had been done to clarify how that should work. And so NRHC, along with many of you as members, engaged with rural development, and we found a path forward. And now that's an effective uh, operating subsidy to support the provision of seasonal farm worker housing, which is very difficult to do. Uh, but, but that's a success, a very specific success that we've had in recent years uh, with NRHC, the agency, and, e and many of you as members. Um, we have some other examples that we want to share with you uh, before we get to an update on some uh, federal issues that Bob's going to talk about. And so um, we're each going to present a brief bit of information. Uh, other members of the National uh, Rural Housing Coalition, including Laura Buxbaum, Kathy Tyler, Rose Garcia, and Andy Saavedra. So now I'd like to invite Laura to come up and share. Okay. Or me. Or you, if you'd prefer to be at the... I, just, yeah. I think I can yeah. just... You, is this on? Can you all hear me? Great. So uh, I am Laura Buxbaum, and uh, I work for an organization called CEI, which stands for Coastal Enterprises in Maine. Um, and I work on federal policy and resource development there. We're uh, a 41-year-old community uh, development corporation and community development financial um, institution, CDFI, uh, with um, a focus a primary mission focus on good jobs, environmentally sustainable enterprises, and shared prosperity. And our, our main focus is on businesses, um, small, medium-sized businesses. We provide financing. We provide technical assistance. But we've worked in the housing um, realm since 1989. And we know that housing is, is a huge piece of all of those other three um, areas. So uh, workers have to have a place to live. Um, uh, um, environmentally, you know, so uh, um, the, the distances that people have to drive uh, has an impact on the environment uh, and shared prosperity. Again, uh, you know, one of the key ways to gain prosperity is to buy a home and build assets or, or at least be able to afford an apartment so that you can save some money. Um, so we have been a housing developer over the years. We are a housing counseling agency. And um, we've been a member of the coalition for quite some time, a long time, long before. I've been there uh, for 11 years, and we were already a member. But I joined the board about nine years ago, I th uh, six years ago. Six years ago. This is my, this is my third term coming up. Um, because uh, we were looking at the landscape in Maine and began to see the looming crisis of uh, 515 rental um, properties going away. And this was before anybody was talking about mortgage maturities. It was simply that we were starting to see aging owners who wanted to get out of the market. And we were trying to figure out as a nonprofit, uh, as many of you have been, how to how we could help uh, affect transfers, whether we could be a developer and an owner, and that sort of thing. Um, and there are uh, a lot uh, of these properties in Maine. There are almost 8,000 units of this housing. I haven't looked recently, because I know some of them have exited, but it's, it's about that still. Um, and so we, I began um, talking to Bob and going to coalition meetings and thinking about um, how we could be most effective and decided to run for the board because I felt that this was a place where, uh, frankly, where maybe I, along with others who are doing rental housing, could, could nudge the coalition in the direction of uh, being a little more proactive around that issue. As you know, I think I'm not sure uh, whether at the time everybody was seeing the crisis, so a few of us were. And so I joined um, really with the idea that, that, that maybe uh, along with others um, in the coalition who were working on this, we could start to work together to figure this out. I, I have to say, uh, sadly, that my organization has not <laughs> figured it out. We are actually, we ha we've actually decided that we are not doing housing development anymore. But as a policy person and seeing how all of these things interlink, I still think it's hugely important. And one of the things that the coalition has, um, one concrete um, 
outcome that has come about through working with the coalition is the new TA pr uh, program. Um, there are four new TA providers for um, uh, working with entities that want to take on uh, 515 projects with maturing mortgages. And uh, Bob was proactive in lobbying on the Hill for that program. And one of those providers is a peer organization of mine in Maine. Uh, they're he, uh, Bill Floyd uh, from Genesis Fund had to leave uh, today, but I'm going to be working hard to get them to be a member because uh, we now have this really, really important new resource that I think is going to help smooth the way for, for many of us. And you know, just back to, to my organization, CEI, we may not be a housing developer anymore, but we are an investor and a lender. And my hope is that through this continued work with all of you and Bob, uh, we can, um, can uh, and getting, you know, continuing to get RD to the table, uh, maybe making legislative change, changes, maybe working for regulatory changes if they're needed, um, simply having that dialogue, that we can actually save these properties. And that's really my goal. And I invite you all, if you are not members of the coalition, to come and join me in helping to fulfill that goal. or. Uh, you know, uh, others will talk about farm worker housing and single family housing, which I, we also agree are hugely important. Uh, so come and join with us to um, work together to, to achieve those goals. My name is Kathy Tyler, and I'm, um, I started working in Texas on farm worker housing in uh, the mid 80s. And I quickly found the Housing Assistance Council and the National Rural Housing Council uh, Coalition and joined and have been active since, I, I think, 1985, 1986. I have a record of never missing a hack conference, and I tell people that may be impressive. I tell people that may be impressive, but there's like a hundred other of us that have that same record, and y'all are probably in the audience and, and members of the Rural Housing Coalition as well. And it's, it's really shameful that farm workers who work so hard, such long hours, such hard, uh, back-breaking jobs, do not have income to pay for affordable, affordable housing. Um, it's, it's, totally shameful and the good news is that we found some solutions and so sometimes we're able to get farm workers into homes where it's not too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter, it's not like they're living outside, their children have fewer respiratory problems and miss fewer schools. So that's, that fewer days in school, that's, that's the success. Um, and there is one federal program that works on, that addresses farm worker housing, and that's the USDA Rural Development 514, 516 Farm Labor Housing Program. And I learned quickly after I, I, I became a member in 1980, whatever, that were it not for the National Rural Housing Coalition, there would be no farm labor housing at USDA. That program, I'm sure, would have gone away. Would have, it's, it's not a big program, doesn't get a lot of attention. And I'm going to say that again, because that's really, that's really the only point I'm trying to make today, is were it not for the Rural Housing Co Coalition, there would be no federal programs that work with, uh, with farm workers. And I, I truly believe that. And I think that's probably true of other programs as well, and maybe others will uh, say what they, they know about that. Um, and I don't think it's that Congress doesn't care. I think it's just that they need to be told. They need to be reminded. They need to be, uh, they need to have the stories of how important this is, uh, how vital to so many vulnerable populations living in our, our rural areas, how vital these programs are. Um, but there's more reason that I come to the coalition meetings year in and year out, and, and that it's a more selfish reason. I get so much information and so much support, and actually just so much joy from the members of the coalition. It, it, they are really my heroes and mentors. So not only are they, are they 
making the case for our rural housing programs on Congress. We're working with USDA officials, HUD officials, the programs that exist, tweaking them, making them work better, and we're helping each other figure out how to do the work that we do. And when I started in the 1980s is when I started in rural. I had been doing housing. And I literally felt like I was running against a brick wall. And so I, I view my cohorts in the coalition as really lifesavers in helping me figure this work out that would have driven me crazy otherwise. And I want to um, read this quote that I often quote. Um, Y'all who are, are not too young would remember that in 1960, right at Thanksgiving, Edward R. Murrow did a um, broadcast called The Harvest of Shame. And he ended that broadcast with this quote. Um, the people you saw in this broadcast have the strength to harvest our fruits and vegetables. They do not have the strength to influence legislation, but maybe we do. So I think that's our calling, and if you're not currently a member of the coalition, please consider joining. It uh, will be helpful to you and definitely helpful to the populations you're trying to serve. I am uh, Rose Garcia, and I'm the executive director of Tierra del Sol Housing Corporation. And uh, Tierra del Sol, the, our name means land of the sun in Spanish. And 45 years ago in New Mexico, a group of farm workers, very humble, uh, practiced the operating philosophy of many of our programs in rural America and rural housing, as well as the, the organization that I will mention in a minute about our advocate, which is National Rural Housing Coalition. Similar operating philosophy. But Tierra del Sol was formed by this group of farm workers that were employed with uh, pecan orchards in New Mexico that were being displaced in their on-farm homes, so they took the initiative with uh, community advocates as well as faith-based ministers to form Tierra del Sol. And through the years, uh, they struggled to develop uh, lots in colonias along the border of New Mexico and West Texas uh, to build homes. They didn't want to have rental housing or block housing uh, being on farm of what they were used to. They wanted to own their own home. And so many farm workers, as you all know, that are advocates are aware of their limited income. Even to this day, after 45 days, that 45 uh, years that Tierra del Sol started, uh, and be able to afford a home as costs are going up in constructing a home with highly stringent regulations with land use uh, restrictions as well as land cost, uh, lack of utilities, and even gap financing. And so farm workers as well as other families, not only the farm workers, because the original leaders, uh, when I came to Tierra del Sol over about 38 years ago, is uh, that if if Tierra del Sol can serve farm workers, then they wanted to extend the program to other families that are the working poor. And so through the years, we've evolved the program to not only serve farm workers, but other working families, as well as multifamily housing, farm worker housing, senior housing, as well as housing rehab, uh, water and sewer development, um, multifamily asset management and uh, small business lending. And through these programs for 45 years have evolved uh, to become the go-to place where working people come to get a fair shake with a, a home that they can afford. Uh, they can get educated how to become a home buyer. 
uh, work on their credit, and as well as home ownership counseling. And, uh, and so the, pro the added value of self-help housing uh, is organizes families and the work groups of about eight to, fam eight, eight to 10 families to build each other's homes, like the old barn raising concept. And so through the years, we've built thousands of units uh, in New Mexico and Texas. And, uh, and so because the new people, and I'm really pleased about this conference because I've observed that we have a large number of newbies, uh, in, whether advocates or workers of, of community development corporations that are new staff, or board members that are present, that are new, um, and they they wonder how can we develop all these housing in all these years? What made the difference? And um, and I'm here on, because I want to promote uh, the wind under our wing. Uh, we're like a bird out there floating to from one colonia to another along the border where families need to live. And so that wind has been the National Rural Housing Coalition because they were formed uh, just three years before we were. And, uh, and through all those years, um, we've stayed together as a member uh, and the, also the ally with Housing Assistance Council. And uh, it's been a very close relationship and so I, I'm a former uh, board president of the National Rural Housing Coalition, so I'm very proud of that. And, um, and it's just a learning uh, experience, having someone to contact, like Bob Raposa, he's perpetual. And uh, <laughs> we've sort of grown up together. <laughs> so he and his team of younger people, which I'm really glad that we're, we're having a succession effort, and they're wonderful, they're very knowledgeable, they're fearless, very humble, very respectful, and, and you know, I will tell you, um, I, my proposal today is that we have a wonderful opportunity with the recent election. As you know, we have probably 40 new congressional people in many districts of our country. And so I urge you, and I'm asking Bob with the coalition to help us identify all the new districts members. And, uh, and then we that are matching the dots, those of us that are members of the coalition, and those of you that I hope will join after this meeting, that you would send to Bob a success story of a real family and their name and get privacy release permission from the family to tell their story, how, how the programs with self-help housing or single family home ownership or rehab or how did they get an apartment, uh, getting, uh, whether they're a senior, whether they got a small business loan. And so this whole menu of federal programs that match also substantial equity from private investors through like this low income housing tax credits where we've had to customize the acts of Congress literally that Bob has helped us to rewrite some of the language and, and the appropriations to fit the, the, this legal mumbo jumbo to fit what the people need and, uh, and so I think that the congressional people, the new ones, and I'm really proud that many are, are women in our state and New Mexico and West Texas. We have all new congressional people that are women. They're diverse from Native American to Latinas to, to just general families. And, uh, and so they relay, they're very passionate about families getting help. And so I think if we can tell those stories and explain that it's this certain family in this district and we explain to the new congressperson 
this is the family that you know, they probably voted for you. But you know most Congress people that I know, the new ones, it doesn't matter whether they voted or not. They have committed publicly and they're very passionate that they will represent everyone. And so I urge you and I ask Bob uh, if we can enlist him and his team to help us put together this kind of effort to, to communicate with the new Congress people, to inform them about the added value of these rural housing programs as well as anything new that we think needs to be uh, reformed or improved and what works and what does not work. And so this is the place to come if you want to make changes and you do it with respect and with it, you're not going to be exposed. And I think it's you know, connecting uh, Bob and his team with our Congress people, and even setting up a meeting for us when we're in town. So I urge you to sign up as a member of the National Rural Housing Coalition, as well as sign up for the newsletter for Housing Assistance Council, because you'll have access to vast current information, as you saw, a lot of research, results that are in process or that have been publicized. They have a library in any kind of subject with housing or economic development. And, uh, and so you'll get ready uh, distributions in your, in your emails uh, of these newsletters. So uh, the resources are here, they're proven, they're reliable. And I think the Congress people will be very grateful because they're being inundated with information. And one thing I can tell them, this is where they can count on the information and the follow-up and the proof of the pudding. One thing about housing is that it is the brick and mortar or the adobes or, or lumber, whatever the houses are, and, and they're real evidence. So it's, uh, we need to enlist this network of new Congress people, as well as those that are not aware of the programs. So I very much encourage you to, to follow up from this meeting and take this brochure that Marty uh, held up and, uh, and, and don't forget that because you'll never be sorry. And, but thank you very much for coming to the conference. And, and I encourage you to contact any of us. We're happy to share with you any of our experience, any of our war stories. So, but thanks a lot for being involved and, and committed to help in uh, rural housing. Thanks, Rose, that was great. Uh, my name is Andy Saavedra. I'm a senior program officer at uh, Rural LISC, Rural Local Initiative Support Corporation. I just wanted to tell two simple anecdotes, kind of reaching out to potential new members of some of the simple benefits of the, of the coalition. Um, at LISC, we're an intermediary, we're CDFI, so basically we raise public and private funds and, and we work with well, several, of, several of you in the room as either our member groups or folks we have lending relationships with uh, doing loans, grants, and technical assistance. So with that kind of job, I'm basically here to help you do your jobs. And I'll get calls all the time with somebody that kind of needs help with something. Uh, I wanted to tell two simple stories. I used to live in, I used to live in Arkansas working in the Mississippi Delta. And I was pretty involved with the state coalition there, and I encourage folks to also be active in their states. And the uh, chair had an issue, they do self-help, and they had an issue with USDA over interpretation of the rural definition, and it was looking like they weren't gonna be able to continue their program. So she called me, because she knows I know some stuff, and I called the Rural Housing Coalition, and I never thought I'd compare I never thought I'd compare Bob Raposa to Olivia Pope from Scandal, but, <laughs> but basically, if everybody knows the show, it was handled. <laughs> um, 
And I don't even know all that they did, but they reached out to the national office, they reached out to the state office, that group got to do self-help for another day. Bob reported it at a board meeting, I was on the conference call, and he didn't even know I had anything to do with it. <laughs> and, but for you, they need to be members, I'm, I'm trying to speak towards how this works for you individually, besides all the macro programs. So it's good to have that team in DC. Um, they're, 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 they're great, I hope they're not as ruthless as the people on the show, but <laughs> you know, you, you gotta have your folks in DC, that's the way this town works, so it's, it's, it's great to have those advocates. They are, they are the humble, earthly vessels of, of our movement, <laughs> and, and our representatives here to get things done. And, and that group was able to continue doing self-help, which was the most important thing, being able to serve families. And then a simple thing happened this week. I got a call from a group in Southern Maryland, and they're trying to figure out how to pay for residential supportive services with their 515 projects. They have some 515 projects, and they're trying to figure out how to pay with it. And I remembered several years ago, Tom Collishaw at one of the board meetings, who's the director of Self-Help Housing Enterprises, spoke specifically with the USDA on that issue and trying to come to some resolution on it. And there is a way to be able to take some money to do that. And I, and I told this guy, you know, dude, you should be a member of the Rural Housing Coalition. If, if, you were, if you were, you'd be at the meeting Tuesday. You'd be able to talk directly to USDA folks on Friday. You'd be able to meet Tom Collishaw himself on Friday and, and, and kind of deal with it. You know, the first thing I did was I talked to uh, Greg Sparks on our team, and that's, I've only worked with Greg for a couple of years, but I've been seeing him, you know, at these conferences for years, and I know he worked for all these groups. Talked to him first and was able to get advice on the situation and how it got handled. I was able to talk to Tom on Tuesday. They emailed that, they emailed that contact, and now he has, a, he has access to, to a solution. The funny thing about that is this guy is the new housing director at uh, Southern Maryland Community Action. If, if Dwayne Yoder's still in the room, he used to run that organization 20 years ago. And they used to do self-help housing, and I need to bring Hack back in the mix on this, and Hack's an important member of the coalition and, and how things work. When the SHOP program started with self-help housing, long story short for the new folks in the room, that goes back to the 90s, if you were, if you were around back then. Um, Newt Gingrich was the new Speaker of the House. Congress wanted to give $50 million to Habitat for Humanity because they were in his district, and that's awesome. And Moises and Joe took some folks from Congress to go down to Southern Maryland, and you, you have some pretty, especially back then, some pretty abject poverty and some pretty bad conditions just an hour and a half from here and showed them what some other folks like you were doing, uh, doing with self-help. Long story short, you know how things go on the hill, numbers change, the 50 million became 40 million. Uh, Habitat got 25 of it, but Housing Assistance Council got 13.6 of it. And Hack staff, some of the folks in this room helped a lot of people in this room with their self-help housing program. That person needs to be a member, that organization still needs to be a member of, of the coalition and, and still needs to be active. We need to continue to build our legacy and network with each other and, 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 and keep this thing going. So for those of you who aren't members, hanging out in this group, having this access is something you need to have and that's crucial to your success long term. None of us would be where we're at if we didn't have all these folks that we've seen around time and time again to be able to pick their brains you know, over the years. And that's practical information for you at home. I, I was briefly a housing director for a couple of years at an organization before I came to work for LISC. I was making peanuts. I didn't have enough money to pay full price for my membership. I sent Bob $50 a month. I still got the emails. <laughs> it wasn't full price, but I needed access to that info you know, to be able to do my job. Not that I, I want everybody to pay full price, but again, I'm trying to speak to the new folks who I know you're new, you're small, you have tight budgets, but you, you got to get in the loop, you got to participate. Thank you. I just, um, because I spoke before all of you, and then I heard all kinds of things, and it, it spurred uh, some stuff for me. So I just wanted to add a couple things. One is I should have mentioned that I'm also a board member of HACC, and I agree with Andy that 
our two organizations are aligned and need to remain aligned and, and it's a huge resource when we can work together so that so folks who uh, participate in HACK and are part of HACK should also consider being part of the coalition to help us continue to align that way. The other is that when Kathy said that farm worker housing would have gone away but for the coalition, I think that's right. But not only that, if you just look at, so if you think about USDA and how huge it is, and within that, how s small rural development and the rural housing service are, uh, they can kind of get lost in the shuffle. And one thing that the coalition has been really, really important in doing is maintaining sufficient appropriations for these key programs that um, the people we work with all count on. Uh, throughout, not just this administration, but throughout uh, all eight years of the Obama administration, the agency budgets were uh, much lower than they should be. And we, the coalition, along with other advocates, worked really hard and successfully to work with our members of Congress and our senators and appropriators and got that money put back in the budget. And that would not have happened without the coalition. So um, I get information that I need when I go to the Hill. Uh, we get meetings that are important and um, uh, Bob's staff here also goes and reinforces all of that. And I, I think that uh, we would not have the resources that we have, and they're not enough, <laughs> but uh, we wouldn't have what we do have without the coalition. So. So I, uh, I want to, to thank the board members for, for their kind words. I'm perpetual, but I haven't been here since the beginning, so just, <laughs> just, just to be clear. I'm Bob Raposa, and I'm, I want to thank Hack, Hack for this opportunity and compliment Hack uh, on this great conference, which seems to have been a, 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 a big success. So I want to talk today about um, Congress, about the about the success that that we have all had and the, the work that uh, that that we still have to, we sh still have to do. So the biggest challenge that I have is trying to work with with one of these things. Ah, great. So um, in the Congress that comes in in um, January. Uh, as, as Rose said, there will be 40 new Democrats. There will be 115 new members of Congress. It's the biggest turnover that Congress has had in a very long time. And to give you a sense of it, even before this, Congress had changed from a group of, of, uh, of uh, the, the members who had, who had been around forever. When I first started this, the chairman of the uh, Appropriations Committee in the House was a Jamie Whitten from, from Mississippi. He had been chairman for 40 years. I couldn't tell him anything. I really hated that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but now, the average, uh, the average tenure of a congressman is less than 10 years. The average tenure of a senator is less than two terms. So it is a completely, it's a completely different world. And these members, by and large, don't very well understand what, what the federal government does. It's a big government. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of, of, of noise, as we all know. And um, so for that reason, the one thing that, that I want to leave with all of you as you go back home is it is well worth your time to get your senator, your congressman, your congresswoman to visit a project, a groundbreaking, a ribbon cutting. Once they see it, they're going to love it. And the key thing is because they don't really understand, they don't understand very well what the government does if they have this mind's eye picture of a self-help family of a 515 uh, uh, development of a, of a farm worker housing development, that's going to change their perspective. And they're going to say, well, this is really great. And I'm for this. So
So, for example, in, in Utah, Brad Bishop of Self-Help Homes, Brad, put up your hand so we can all see you, had his congressman out to, to visit the project. This guy is no liberal, but he spent the day working with these families, building a, a self-help home, and Brad got the press there. So let's see if this works. Cue the video. <laughs> there. All right. Utah Congressman Chris Stewart made his first visit to a self-help home site in Leverkin Monday afternoon. The congressman joined others by putting in a little sweat equity in 100 degree temperatures. Representative Stewart tried out his own building skills by nailing in a few walls. It's a wonderful program where they can get into a home they couldn't afford otherwise. And uh, it's kind of a win-win. They get a home, uh, they get to learn some experience and to learn some things. I had a chance to do it in that once and I thought I can do this. And, I didn't realize before that I could. So yeah, we had Congressman Stewart come out and visit to see how some of our federal dollars are at work through the Department of Agriculture, uh, through the Mutual Self-Help Housing Program. And so we, we let him uh, come out and work a couple hours with us. And yeah, it was a great, great event to let him see how our tax dollars are at work. Small groups of families are learning how to use the tools and building materials to construct each other's homes from the ground up. Even experienced home builders are impressed on how the future homeowners have taken a nap to their new tasks. It's nice, it's great to see, uh, you know, not just anybody like, like me, I'm a framer every day, so I, I just I go in and do it. It's nice to see that people that different backgrounds can actually uh, do this, you know, within a couple of weeks people were acting like they, they were daily framers. The Self-Help Homes program has been helping to facilitate the building of more than 450 affordable homes throughout Utah. So far, at least 13 of those homes are in southern Utah, and many are in this Laverkin neighborhood. Mutual Self-Help Housing has really helped a lot of families that are uh, hardworking families that are just trying to get uh, get into a home and have home ownership and just have that same opportunity as, as many others. Housing is a real issue for many people here in, in Utah now, and housing is so expensive. And we've got a lot of young families that are really struggling on how they can afford a new home. This is a real solution. Uh, and, and it gets me into a beautiful home too, in, a, in beautiful locations. Um, but uh, it, takes, it takes hard work. I mean, gosh, people out here working and it's 100 and something degrees, right? So it's not easy, uh, but they work together with a group of people, make new friends, learn some new skills, get a new home. Like I said, win, win, win. Each family must contribute 35 hours a week for eight to 12 months. No one can move in until all the homes are complete. It doesn't cost the government a lot of money uh, for the return on investment. It's a huge return. This is a good program. The congressman left his mark by signing one of the walls he helped put up. To have, have his signature on one of the homes, I think that, that was neat to see. Great to see that our, our uh, public officials and all that are interested in the program and willing to volunteer some time. The seven homes being built by these families are expected to be completed around Christmas. Melissa Anderson, CEC News. So folks, that is gold. And that's the kind of thing that we sell these programs on. All the slick talk from the coalition doesn't help as much as a congressman or a, or a senator getting to a site, building a home, seeing a project. And I understand that people are, are busy and have got, got lots, lots to do, but the one thing that I want to leave with, with you is the importance of doing this, this kind of thing. It really pays off. So, Brad, great job, congratulations. So, the, the work of the coalition, aha, uh -huh. wait, there, has been focused for the, the, the most part on the, on the programs that 
the agriculture department has. And those programs, as I tell people on the Hill, man, are a great success story between, between, uh, between home ownership and rental housing and farm worker housing and, 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 home, and, home, and home repair, the agriculture department programs with the, with the help of folks here, folks across the country has helped the millions of poor families get the better housing. So despite the fake news that you hear from down the street, um, we have a success story, a real success story. And part of what we have to do is to continue to beat the drum back home and here to sell that story. That said, there's a good bit that, that, that has yet to be done. There's a home repair number five. I just figured out that, that I can, I can, I can see what's going on on this one. <laughs> so, we have a lot of challenges. For, for, for lots of, of rural communities across the country, they still haven't recovered from, from, from the Great Recession. The, the, the prosperity that we are seeing at, at the moment seems to be, for the most part, in big cities, not so much in, in farming communities. The, 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 the median income for the country as a whole is $54,000. For, for rural areas, it's $30,000. So rural families are poorer, they have worse housing, and, and don't have the economic opportunities that families elsewhere have. At the same time, the federal resources that are important to, to help these families haven't kept pace. Rental assistance helps less than, than helps just over half, uh, half of the families in, 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 the, in the worst housing conditions in, in this country. And of course, that rental assistance helps families, senior citizens, persons with, with, with disabilities, and is, and is obviously for those families and the 630,000 of them in small communities, extremely important. An important source of, of funding for rental housing over the last 30 years has been the, the, the uh, Section 515 program. In, in the many small communities across the country, the only, uh, the only uh, affordable rental housing in town is that, 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 section, that section 515 development. Through budget cuts, we have not um, done well in, in being able to, to, to preserve the, 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 por the portfolio. At, at one time, Congress funded uh, Section 515 at, uh, at, at um, a, 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 a billion dollars every year. Now that funding is about $25 million. So what we are left with is an, an, an aging, port, aging portfolio, $5.6 $5 billion in, in, in long-term costs to, to, to preserve that portfolio. And we aren't doing anything through, through agriculture to add, add the developments to the portfolio. So, all of the funding from, from USDA at, at the moment, and there's not much of it, 
goes to, to preserving the, 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 the portfolio that we currently have. At the same time, and Hack has done a great job on, on, on this issue, is that we have this rising tide of maturing mortgages, which is right now just offshore, but it's coming at us. And we don't have a resource base at the moment to come up with, with, with ways to, to deal with that issue also. Part of the problem is, of course, that, that these mortgages are connected to rental assistance. You can't have one without the other. So one of the challenges that, that, that we face is finding a way to, 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 to restore the portfolio, to continue funding for, for 515, and to try to, to keep those projects as affordable housing. These days, we we don't build. Mar we, this this country doesn't build doesn't build um, um, very much very very much very much housing anymore. In 2016, only 71,000 homes across the country were were built in in rural communities. It's the lowest ever. And part of the problem is, of course, with low incomes in small communities, putting together the cost to develop housing and, and, and having that housing uh, uh, affordable for those families at the $30,000 range, the $40,000 range, is extremely difficult. Now, now, one would think in that kind of situation where you have a, a White House that uh, is, has uh, depended on the, on the rural vote for its success for being there, that the Agriculture Department would, would be the, the, the favorite agency, that they'd be adding funds to Section 502 to, to uh, Section 515. And that's not been the case. So um, it is hard to, to see how um, small communities improve their housing stock without an investment of federal funds, which at the moment aren't coming out of the president's budget. So if you look at funding for the agriculture uh, department for Section 502 for, 504 for home repair loans, for self-help housing, for funds to, to preserve Section 515. Those funds have been mostly at the same rate for several years now. Rental assistance, which does help 270,000 families across the country, has increased to, to, cover those, the, to cover those families, but has not added new families to, the, to their portfolio. So at base with, with, rental, uh, with, with that account, families aren't, aren't being kicked off, but we aren't adding families. If you think about, um, funding for community development at HUD, at the Agriculture Department, at the Commerce Department, as a share of the GDP, those programs have, have fallen by 75% over the last 30 years. CDBG, which of course is um, the flagship, the first budget request for CDBG was $2.6 billion in 1976. I was not here then. Um, and the budget request, um, the last budget request that was zero uh, was from Obama, and that was for $3 billion. So these programs, the housing programs, the community development programs, haven't kept pace. And that is also true for, for HUD vouchers.
So finally, and you're, 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 you're beginning to, to uh, think, how could this get worse? Um, the relative success that, that we have had in turning back the budget cuts for the agriculture department, that the, the HUD advocates have, have had for, for uh, turning back the cuts at HUD, has depended in part on a budget deal that was struck between the White House and the Congress in February of this year. And that budget deal um, re restored funding by, 20, by 150, $150 um, um, billion dollars for defense programs and domestic programs. And that was a two-year deal, which, which, uh, which it means that it expires at the end of this fiscal year. So the president and the White House will, will have to get back together and come up with a budget deal or cut about $100 billion from discretionary funding. Um, in, 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 in Washington, you, you can have the same circumstances in a, in a, a different outcome. So the circumstances that, that we have for 2020, fiscal year 2020, is that the Congress and the White House face these budget cuts again. The interest that the White House will have is in defense, is, is in the defense budget. Um, and the question will be what, how, what are the House Democrats going to, to, to do with, with the, the, the majority that they currently have? And that's, that's a big question. Part of the reason they got it done this past year was because you had re Republicans in, in the Congress who, who, who ran the House and the Senate who said to the White House, you have got to get this, you have got to, to accede to, to the funding number on the discretionary side for domestic programs to get the, the, the defense number. Whether that happens again is a good question. So I'm going to pause there. Um, I think there are a couple minutes left. Please wrap up. I've got three minutes. Uh, <laughs> comments or questions from anyone? I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Hack and, and their great work on this conference. Thanks to the board of the coalition, to the board, to the board members here, my, my good friends, and thank you very much.